So, uh, hi, John. Uh, we're Dick Price and Sharon Kyle from LA Progressive. We produced LA Progressive Social Justice Magazine for 13 years. And we're so glad that, that you're uh, willing to sit still for, for an interview. My By way of introduction, to do it. Thanks for the invitation. Great. So by way of introduction, for people who aren't totally familiar with your story, for 14 years, you served as a CIA analyst and case officer, which included leading the team that captured Al-Qaeda's Abu Zadeda in Pakistan in 2002. But then in 2007, three years after you resigned, you became the first CIA officer to publicly acknowledge that, a CI, that the CIA used torture and its use was official, official policy under the George W. Bush administration. Five years later, in 2012, the Obama administration filed espionage charges against you. You eventually pled guilty to violating the Intelligence Identities Protection Act by confirming the name of an officer involved in the infamous CIA rendition program Sentenced to 30 months in prison, you were released in 2015 after serving almost two years. And you've written several books about your various experiences, all with great titles. The Reluctant Spy, My Secret Life in the CIA's War on Terror, The Convenient Terrorist, Abu Zubaydah, and The Weird Wonderland of America's Secret Wars, and Doing Time Like a Spy, How the CIA Taught Me to Survive and Thrive in Prison, and then Sharon, a little bit later, wants to drill into your prison experiences. You also wrote a series of uh, letters uh, entitled Letters from Loretto, written from uh, the prison in Pennsylvania. So uh, as a first question, given that we're, we're working on uh, uh, the Assange issues, what parallels can you draw from your, your treatment by the U.S. government and its current treatment of uh, Julian Assange? I think that the U.S. government, specifically the Justice Department, has learned lessons uh, from a string of whistleblowers, and they're not good lessons. You know, one of the very first whistleblowers uh, post Dan Ellsberg that the CIA and the Justice Department went after was Tom Drake from NSA, and they charged Tom with nine felonies, including seven counts of espionage, that case completely fell apart and they had to drop every one of those, those felony charges. Uh, they began charging um, other whistleblowers. In fact, just during the Obama administration, there were eight of us that were charged under the Espionage Act. And each one of those cases got a little stronger because the Justice Department learned from its previous mistakes and it learned a lot from the Drake case. So when it got, for example, to Reality Winner, who uh, was an NSA whistleblower and who was accused of, of leaking one page of paper, uh, a classified analysis on Russian involvement with the Trump campaign. She got five and a quarter years for leaking that one page of paper. Uh, Terry Albury, an FBI agent in Minneapolis, Minnesota, leaked a barely classified memo <laughs> saying that there was systemic racism in the FBI's uh, hiring and promotion process and got three and a half years in prison for that. Now, this law, the, the uh, Espionage Act, was written in 1917 to combat German saboteurs during the First World War. It's never been meaningfully updated, and it was meant to go after uh, uh, spies, real spies, spies who steal secrets for foreign countries. It was never meant to be an iron fist against journalists and against whistleblowers. And that's where Julian comes in. This is the first time, uh, at least in the last 75 years, that the U.S. government has gone after a journalist, a decorated journalist in this case, using the Espionage Act but not just the Espionage Act. They've enlisted the help of, of allies like the UK and Ecuador, and we learned recently Spain, uh, to spy on him, to keep him in what was essentially a solitary confinement in a, in a situation that Niels Melzer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, calls torture. And so what the Justice Department did to us whistleblowers 
they've done in spades to Julian Assange and they've coupled that with especially harsh treatment. So what do you think the consequences is, uh, for the public's right to know and journalism? Is this throwing a wet blanket or, uh, I mean, it seems to be intended to scare the bejesus out of potential whistleblowers and, and in the case of James Risen, journalists who might talk to them. Yeah, a CIA officer told um, uh, Scott Shane of the New York Times after my uh, my incarceration that the point wasn't to convict me of a crime. It wasn't even to incarcerate me. It was to scare the daylights out of anybody else who was considering blowing the whistle on waste, fraud, abuse, or illegality. And Scott Shane said that on the day of my arrest, literally all of the New York Times national security sources went silent and stayed silent for more than six months. So that really is the point. The point is to frighten people. Now, in the case of Julian, it, it's more than that. It's worse than that. Because this is a journalist doing his job as a journalist. He's being prosecuted for journalism. So if Julian is found guilty under the Espionage Act, then what's to keep this administration or the next one from finding uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter from the New York Times or the Washington Post guilty of espionage for reporting on national security? This is a very slippery slope. And I, I don't think I'm overstating it by saying that the Constitution is in danger here, at least the First Amendment is. So, so given that threat to the First Amendment, Amendment and to journalists in general, why do you think the mainstream journalists and mainstream media are generally so quiet about your case, Jeffrey Sterling's case, Julian Assange? I mean, there are, there are good articles. I read a good article in the New Yorker about you, but I mean, they're few and far between. And, mm -hmm. and it's a direct threat to the First Amendment and to journalism. Why are they quiet? I actually asked a Knight Ritter journalist why uh, he was quiet. And he said, because Julian Assange is an activist, not a journalist. And I said, maybe he's an activist, but at the very least, he's a publisher. And WikiLeaks has never had to issue a correction uh, or, or apologize for saying something or publishing something that was incorrect. And certainly the New York Times and the Washington Post and others um, have, have landed huge scoops based on the information that Julian Assange has published. Uh, you know, I think that there's a root cause to all this though, and that is uh, the demise of investigative journalism in the United States. These big outlets uh, by and large don't have budgets anymore for real investigative journalism. And so instead of developing sources inside the CIA or NSA or the FBI, they just go to the Office of Public Affairs. And I know some journalists who have told me to my face that they don't have the time or the money to develop these journalists. They go to the Office of Public Affairs and the Office of Public Affairs has threatened them that if they publish anything that the CIA doesn't like, that they will be cut off forever and they won't have access to any information anymore. And they just don't want to risk that at this stage of their careers. They're willing just to do as they're told. You know, there's another thing too. Ken Delanian, who used to be uh, a pretty prominent front page reporter for the Los Angeles Times, he's since moved on to uh, NBC and MSNBC. He was caught a few years ago sending his articles to the CIA for clearance before sending them to his own editor. We know that thanks to Jason Leopold of BuzzFeed who filed a Freedom of Information Act request and caught Ken Delaney in red handed. That's not journalism. Uh, that's, that's fascism uh, to tell you the truth. It's authoritarianism. It's bad for our democracy. So uh, it's reported that you still support the CIA mission generally but you had a crisis no. of con uh, conscious. Oh, that's not true. Okay. So no, that's not true. I've, I've written extensively on, on the fact that I, I don't think that there ought to be a CIA. I've said okay. as recently as a, as a week ago that the, the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research does analysis that is at least as good as the CIA's. Uh, NSA uh, has, has far superiority over the CIA in technical collection. The Pentagon's Defense Human Services uh, Bureau uh, runs human source intelligence. 
And so the CIA is redundant. There's no reason to have a CIA. And then when it, with a track record dating back to 1947 of, of overthrowing governments and murdering world leaders and interfering in elections and abusing human rights, I just don't see what good the organization is. There's no reason for it to be around. So when you um, retire, retired or when you left, and was it 2004? Yes. Was it for these reasons? In part, uh, you know, when I got back from, from Pakistan in 2002, uh, within days of my arrival back at headquarters, I was asked if I wanted to be trained in the use of what they called enhanced interrogation techniques. I had never heard that term before, and I asked what it meant. And the, the CIA officer who had pitched me explained what it was. And I said, man, that sounds like the torture program. That can't possibly be legal. And very excitedly, he said, we're going to get rough with these guys. And he claimed that it was legal. It had been approved by the Justice Department and by the National Security Advisor and signed by the president, all of which was true. Well, I had a moral and ethical problem with it besides being pretty doggone certain that this was illegal. I, I don't care what the Justice Department said, this is illegal. And, and I can get into details why I believe that. And I turned it down. Well, that caused me to have a, to, to gain a nickname, uh, the human rights guy. And um, I kind of chuckled the first time I heard it. And my boss pulled me aside and he said, buddy, that's not a compliment. <laughs> and then I got passed over for promotion. And I had just captured the number three in Al Qaeda with, with these hands. And I was passed over for promotion. And I went and complained and, and was told, look, and these were the exact words that the head of the CIA's counterterrorism center used, that I displayed a shocking lack of commitment to counterterrorism because I wouldn't torture Abu Zubaydah. Now, I like to think I'm a student of history, right? I have a deep interest in it. I read constantly. And I knew that in 1946, we executed Japanese soldiers who had waterboarded American prisoners of war. We executed them. That was a death penalty offense. In January of 1968, the Washington Post ran a front page photograph of an American soldier waterboarding a North Vietnamese prisoner. The day that that picture ran in the post, Robert McNamara, the infamous Secretary of Defense, um, ordered an investigation. The soldier was arrested. He was convicted of torture and sentenced to 20 years at Leavenworth. Well, the law never changed. We changed. So why was this a death penalty offense in 1946 and worthy of, worthy of 20 years in prison in 1968, but then in 2002, no, it's, it's perfectly fine. You can do whatever you want. Well, that's not the way the government works. We're supposed to be a nation ruled by law, a nation governed by the rule of law. And so if you want to torture people, then you're gonna have to pass the law saying that it's okay to torture people because as things stand now, torture is illegal. And indeed, if someone at the Justice Department wanted to pursue it, you can be sentenced to death for it. That was my objection. One point and then I'll turn it to you. So interestingly, uh, yesterday we saw a play called Our Man in Santiago, uh, a, a delightful play, but it's about the assassination of Salvador Allende. Mm -hmm. So Sharon has some questions. You bet. <laughs> yeah, I want I, my questions are going to be centered around um, your prison experience. And but first, I want to ask you: so your parents immigrated here uh, from Greece? My grandparents did. Grandparents. My, did. Yep. Okay, and so and you were raised in Sharon, Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah, in nearby. I was born in Sharon and raised in nearby Newcastle, Pennsylvania. So I'm wondering, um, with be, being second generation America, American and coming from the area of the country that you came from, does your, has your sense of America and our various systems changed in the past? Oh. Oh. <laughs> wow, yes. Capital Y, capital E, capital S. Uh, you know, Western Pennsylvania is, it's blue dog country. Um, 
everybody's registered Democrat and they're all very conservative, pro-labor, pro-life, pro-gun. Uh, it was very heavily Amish country. Uh, so I grew up out in the sticks. And um, my, my grandparents were so grateful to be in this country and instilled in us such a sense of gratefulness that I only considered public service. I didn't even think, I didn't even consider going into, you know, business or banking or whatever. I don't even know what I would do um, outside of public service. And then when this position at the CIA presented itself, you know, the CIA pitched me. I, I didn't apply to the CIA. Um, I, I saw it as a way to serve my country and a way to see the world, which I really, really wanted to do. And I sought out a friend of a friend um, I had a, a friend in grad school whose boyfriend worked for the CIA and um, she, she set up a dinner for us because I had questions about human rights to tell you the truth. And so um, we had dinner in DC one night and he assured me that um, things had changed with the church commission. Those changes had stuck. Uh, those bad old days were behind us blah, 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 you're going to have a, a great experience there. And I thought, okay. And I was naive. I was what, 23 years old. And, um, and so uh, I accepted the job. And then Bill Clinton became president. And sure enough, the agency initiated something called a cull, where they went through the files of literally every source who had been recruited and if any source had a problem with human rights in his or her background they were um they were fired uh, we use the word terminated but people are gonna make too much of that they were just fired and told that we just can't work with them anymore fully one third of the cia's recruited assets were fired in that call and i remember saying to a colleague wow Bill Clinton is serious about human rights. I got to tell you how happy I am about this. I think I really made the right decision here. And that held until September 11th, 2001. And things not just changed, but changed to the point where we crossed a Rubicon and there's no going back. Not until some point when members of the Congressional Oversight Committees decide that their job really does include oversight. You know, Frank Church is dead. Otis Pike is dead. Ted Kennedy is dead. And no one really took their places ideologically. And so instead of overseers on Capitol Hill, we have committees that are made up of little more than cheerleaders. I confronted Ron Wyden, the Democratic Senator from uh, Oregon, when I got home from prison. And um, I said, you know, Senator, I, I, I frankly expected a little bit more support from you. And he got very angry and he said, look, it takes all of my energy just to not lose my security clearance. And I thought, wow, so that's what it's about. They even control Ron Wyden. All they have to do is threaten him, say something we don't like and we're gonna take your security clearance. And how in the world are you gonna serve on the oversight committee without a security clearance? So. My position right now is that there's no hope of reform at the CIA. It can't be reformed because it has so protected itself bureaucratically that no one from the outside can change it. Interesting, interesting. So your time in prison clearly, uh, based on my readings of your letters, uh, gave you a deeper understanding of the so-called uh, US correctional system. Right. Um, for those who haven't read any of your letters, do you want to talk about, well, for example, your last letter where you, you list 19 different things that you won't miss about yes. being in prison. And I thought it was somewhat striking that of those 19, it seemed to me that every single one of them had to do with staff, with the exception yes. of maybe the pedophiles. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't miss the pedophiles. But yeah, uh, one of the things that I that I learned very, very quickly was the problem in prison and the danger in prison is from staff. Uh, look, the, the truth is, and this is an ugly truth, 
But the Bureau of Prisons is really nothing more than an employment agency for otherwise unemployable, undereducated uh, white guys. Yes. These prisons are in the in a place where the nearest town is. This is oftentimes the only employer in town. And if you're somebody who has gotten out of the military and got thrown out of the police academy or just couldn't cut it in the police academy, where else are you going to work? Where else are you going to work where the only qualifications are a GED and no felony convictions? That's literally the only qualifications to be a prison guard in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Seriously. A GED and no felony convictions. And then, you know, you give people a badge and a stick and you've created a monster a monster that that was one thing that i learned very very quickly another thing you know everybody knows this joke that you know everybody's in everybody in prison is innocent right i was shocked at the number of people that i would have concluded were innocent or people who were guilty of some minor um crime and then drew draconian sentences. You know, for example, um, I had been in prison about a year and uh, a new prisoner showed up um, in the uh, visitor room. And the only reason I noticed him was that he was covered in tattoos from his neck to his toes, his hands, even the palms of his hands, completely, totally covered in tattoos. He turned out to be a very nice guy. And he was from right there in the area. He, he was born and raised within 20 miles of the prison. And every single weekend, his wife would come with their four daughters, little girls, like between five and 12. And they loved their dad. And they would take turns sitting on his lap. And he, he was so kind to them and sweet to them. So finally, one day, I went up to him and introduced myself. And um, in the course of the conversation, I asked him, do you mind if I ask you what you're in for? And he said, yeah, I got caught, I got caught uh, taking a carload of weed from Pennsylvania to Ohio. He, he ran a, a heating and air conditioning business that he had built himself. It wasn't doing well. M most of the houses in Pennsylvania don't have air conditioning. It, it's not hot enough. And so... Um, he thought he'd make some extra money by taking a little bit of weed across the state line. Well, that's a federal crime and it's, and it's uh, transportation. They gave him 20 years in prison, 20 years. So not only does he have the obvious cost of not watching his girls grow up, they're all gonna be married and gone by the time he gets out of prison. But the government's actions put a dozen people out of work. He employed a dozen people. And I had to ask rhetorically, is society better off with him locked up in a cage? Are we safer as a country with him in a cage? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Now, the pedophiles, I understand, the pedophiles are dangerous, right? And I, I met, you know, a serial killer. I met a contract killer. There are a lot of bad, dangerous people who need to be in prison. But people in on drug sentences? I mean, I know it, it would be a mammoth undertaking, but honestly, I feel like every single person in America who is in prison on a drug charge should have a sentence review because this is ridiculous. You know, I'll, I'll fall back on these very well-known statistics that the Washington Post published. We have 5% of the world's population here in the United States, and we have 25% of the world's prison population, and there is no justification for that whatsoever. I, I did my own little study for a piece that I wrote a couple of years ago, and I found that Congress creates 50 new crimes every year, not laws. They don't pass 50 new laws. They create 50 new felonies every single year. They've done this for the last 20 years, where a year ago, there was some action that was perfectly legal that this year is a felony. That is a thousand new felonies in the last 20 years. This is 
inexcusable. We can't continue living like this. It's not tech. Absolutely. Wow. So um, the letters that you wrote were so open and honest. Did you, I mean, based on knowing Thank you. that your, your, your letters were read, you know, by the staff, did you fear retribution? I mean, they didn't so dare. Brave. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it all started as an accident. Um, one of my attorneys, Jesslyn Radak, uh, the day that I left uh, for prison, she said to me, look, when you get on your feet and you feel comfortable, send me a letter and I'll circulate it among, there were like 600 people that had signed up for a mailing list that just wanted to know how I was doing. So I said, okay. So about six weeks later, I felt, all right, I, I feel like I know what I'm doing here. I'm going to write a letter and just tell everybody I'm doing fine and tell them what some of the experiences are like. So I wrote that first, what I called letter from Loretto. And I did to honor Martin Luther King and his uh, letter from Birmingham jail. So, um, so I wrote this thing and I gave two, I told two stories. I gave two examples of staff malfeasance, not thinking that people don't do that, right? You don't call out staff. So I called them out and, um, and I sent it to Jessalyn and she put it on the mailing list, but I didn't know that Jessalyn was friends with Ariana Huffington. And so she sent it to Ariana who put it like this banner headline on the Huffington Post and it went completely crazy. I got 2 million hits that first week. I ended up giving interviews to Jake Tapper came, um, came to the prison to interview me and I gave an interview to Playboy and NPR and the Atlantic Monthly and oh my I can't even remember but it it went everywhere all the three broadcasts the four broadcast networks CNN Fox and MSNBC it just went everywhere and I could tell one day like people are looking at me and you know giving me the thumbs up and I'm like yeah okay but that thought that was weird and then finally one of the guards a female guard pulled me aside and she said have I ever been rude to you and I said no I I don't think we've ever had any interaction so you're not talking about me in that thing I said what thing <laughs> and she said that letter you wrote I said the letter from Loretto she said yes I said how have you seen that and she says everybody in America has seen it I said what are you talking about and so she allowed me into the guard booth and showed me on the internet. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> but, and, and, and of course I get called to the warden's office and he wants to know the names of the, of the guards. And I said, what, you want me to do your job for you now too? I said, I'm not a rat. I said, you know, let me have my, my speak my piece, but I'm not ratting anybody out. I never used any names, never. And so, um, the more I thought about it, the more that I realized that if I could remain that public, it would protect me from them because they knew that I had access to the media. You know, it's funny. One of the things that I did after I had been there about six months, um, sorry, I just checking the gate. I'm, I keep getting these texts saying that we're boarding and we're not boarding. So. One of the things that I did after I'd been there about six months was to file a Freedom of Information Act request on myself with the Bureau of Prisons, just out of curiosity. And I got back about uh, 200 pages and 90% of it was garbage. It was just my visitors list and my health records and stuff like that. But then there were about six pages that were clearly marked at the top and the bottom of each page, FOIA exempt, do not release to inmate. So either they're so stupid in the Freedom of Information Act office that they can't read, or somebody took pity on me and decided that I had a right to see this stuff. So what it was, was it was, it was memos from the warden to the staff before I got there, warning them that I had access to the media. And one of them was just, it was one sheet. And in these huge block letters, it said, warning, 
inmate has access to the media. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. And so I realized that, that they were far more afraid of me than I was of them. Um, they did try to shut me down a couple of times. They tried to rip my desk off the wall, uh, but I, I had heard a rumor that they were gonna do it. So I paid a guy a bag of tuna fish to strip the, the screws. And sure enough, two hours later, they came and tried to, to yank it off and they just couldn't get their drill to, to uh, get the screws out. And um, there were a couple that I had to smuggle I had to smuggle out, which was a little bit difficult. That drove them crazy. But you know, most of those letters, all I did was I just put them in an envelope and sent them. That was it. Um, I would send one to my lawyer in legal mail, which they're not allowed to search. They're not allowed to search anything you send to a journalist. So I would send one to uh, Jane Hampshire at uh, Shadowproof. It used to be called firedoglake.com one to my lawyer, one to my wife, um, one to my publisher, because I wanted to turn it into to a book later. And so they just couldn't figure out how I was getting them out. And I allowed them to think that I had this sophisticated smuggling operation going. In fact, I was just put an envelope and put a stamp on it and send it. Uh, wow. So it's, it's sort of ironic. It appears that the systems of of corruption within the prison system almost paralleled what was going on at the cia in terms of not wanting the media you know not wanting to put light oh, yeah. on what was really going on abuse of power oh yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. The, the the parallels were striking they really were i mean at a at a jv kind of level but um but yeah, you know, we've got the uh, commissary, right? The commissary has an across the board 30% markup. And that 30% is supposed to be used to buy athletic equipment, books for the library, things like that. Well, instead, and I know this because I filed a Freedom of Information Act request, instead they took the 30%. Um, we didn't get any athletic equipment or books for the library. And instead it bought them workout equipment and a large screen TV for the, for the guards lounge. Well, you know what, that's illegal. You can't do that. Uh, but that kind of petty corruption is, is a way of life there. One, one guard got caught that they fired him. He deserved it. He got caught. Um, ju he just backed up his his pickup truck to the commissary and loaded a thousand dollars worth of groceries into the back of his pickup truck and just drove home. Well, you, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, that's grand theft. So, 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 they, early, so early in this interview, you talked about how the CIA is, um, it's redundant and it shouldn't exist. How do you feel about the prison abolition movement? Uh, I support a lot of what the prison abolition movement um, stands for. I, I do not support the complete abolition of prisons. I, I learned that there are some very, very dangerous people in prison. Um, there are people with severe, untreatable mental illness, uh, psychoses, anti-social personality disorders. There are a lot of sociopaths and psychopaths people who are genuinely dangerous. But, you know, why does no other country have the same kind of carceral problems that we do? Why does no other country have the kind of recidivism that we do? You know, look, if you take a guy out of some terrible neighborhood and you charge him with a drug crime and you put him in prison for 10 years or 15 or 20 years, you provide him no programming you don't teach him to be a plumber or a mechanic or an electrician, and then you let him out. What do you think he's gonna do? He's gonna go back and do the only thing that he knows how to do because you didn't teach him anything else. So that's why we have the recidivism rates that we have because we do these people wrong by not helping them to improve their lives. What better opportunity? You have literally a captive audience. What better opportunity to give someone a marketable skill and help them turn their lives around? And the prison system doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 
I, I really have come to believe that, I mean, I was never a supporter of the so-called war on drugs, but, but now I feel like I have a, a rich understanding of just how wrong and dangerous this, this awful policy has been. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so, it's paralyzing, crippling to our society. You know, when one out of every four black men is on parole, probation, or in prison, you've got a problem. And the problem's not crime. The problem is a policy problem. But nobody wants to talk about that. Right, because those people have been labeled um, disregardable. Sort yes. Of like what's happened to Julian? Exactly. Assange. And what happened to you when you were given the label of a what, the human rights person? Mm -hmm. First, your label. Yeah. It's okay to just do whatever to you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Isn't that the truth? There was a guy that I was there with. Um, I I was warned about him in advance. He was he was very dangerous, and he was a a serial killer. Um, the the story was that he had killed fourteen women. He was a long distance truck driver and he was killing prostitutes at truck stops along his route. This was in the 1970s before the use of DNA. And so he picked up a 16 year old prostitute and raped her and strangled her and threw her into a ditch on the side of the road, thinking that she was dead, but she wasn't. And she recovered and she identified him. The police knew that he was the serial killer, but they just couldn't prove it. So they got him on the rape charge and, um, and he got 20 years. Um, he got out after doing the 20 years at a state facility in Colorado. And the cops and the prosecutors were afraid that he was going to start killing people again. So they sort of set him up. Um, they harassed him at home uh, with, with unannounced visits and inspections of his house until finally he got so angry that he punched his parole officer. Well, they found a gun in his house. There's a mandatory minimum sentence of eight years for being a felon with a gun. Uh, they got him for assault on a federal officer. He ended up with another 20 years. So um, even though he was never convicted of, of any of the murders, 40 years in prison is enough to make people feel safer. Uh, he ended up going to a higher security prison because, well, it was because I, I set him up to tell you the truth. I was a little bit afraid of this guy. Everybody was afraid of him. For whatever reason that I never understood, he actively sought my approval. Um, he would say, you know, hey, John, I saved you a seat in the TV room to watch the game today. Okay, thanks, truck. Um, hey, John, there's a new classic rock station at uh, 16, 10 a.m. Appreciate it, truck. <clears throat> well, one day, there was a guy that had been giving me problems. Uh, he was a contract killer and, um, and was doing 20 to life for murdering um, uh, a businessman in Pittsburgh. And so, uh, so this guy wanted to move into my, into my room. And I, I said I was, in, I was uncomfortable with his crime. I said, I don't want any pedophiles in my room and I don't want any contract killers. So tough. So, you know, the, the guards would at least let us have a vote if somebody wanted to move into our, into our cell. So we voted no. And he was furious. Well, one day I got, a, I got called to the lieutenant's office because NPR had requested an interview and I had to go down and sign a, a waiver allowing the interview. And I'm sitting next to truck in the TV room and this contract killer... <laughs> he's standing like three feet away from me. I'm right behind him and he just didn't see me. He's standing at the email computers and he says to the guy next to him, hey, did you hear Kiriaku got, got called down to the lieutenant's office? And the guy said, yeah. And the contract killer says, that guy's a rat. He went down there to rat us out. Well, if you call somebody a rat, blood's gonna be spilled. So I'm sitting there like this in the chair and truck says to me, did you hear that? That guy just called you a rat. Like, what are you gonna do about it? And I said to truck, an hour ago, I heard him call you a pedophile. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's to totally untrue. <laughs> 
without saying a single word, he got up and he beat that guy into a coma. Mm. Yeah, into a coma. And so truck got another five years onto his 40 and was shipped to a medium security prison. They upgraded him. And this contract killer, he was in the hospital for several weeks. And then he was in solitary confinement for a few weeks after that. Finally, he came back and a couple guys told him what I had done. Oh. And so he walked up to me and he still had like visible injuries. And he says very meekly, I want to apologize for calling you a rat. I should never have done that. And I'm sorry, it won't happen again. And I said to him very quietly, this is what I learned in prison. I said, if I ever hear my name cross your lips ever again, you're dead. Do you understand? And he just said, yes, like this. And you know what? I never had to lift a finger. And I let truck do my dirty work and everybody saw what happened. And so nobody messed with me. They already saw that the guards didn't mess with me. And now they didn't mess with me either. Wow. So I, I hate. So Julian Assange is still, um, the, his extradition is still pending largely be, because of the state of our yes. prison system here in the United States. Yes. Yes. And you know, the European Court of Human Rights has, has twice ruled against the extradition of other prisoners uh, that the U.S. was seeking, uh, one on drug charges and one on an international fraud charge. But our prison system is so well known for its decrepit state and for our weaponized use of solitary confinement that the European uh, Court of Human Rights won't extradite people. That's why I can't imagine, even though, even though we've already gone through Brexit, I can't imagine that a court of appeals would extradite Julian, especially now in light of two things. Number one is the reporting from um, Mike Isakoff at Newsweek that the CIA had made plans to kill Julian or to snatch him. And two, uh, because the FBI's sole source is a convicted pedophile and fraudster who has admitted to making up half of what he told the FBI. I mean, no, no judge in his right mind would agree to extradite somebody based on that. I, I can't even believe, and th this is one of the real disappointments for me with the Biden administration. I can't believe Biden just hasn't walked away from this. What You, you want another humiliating defeat? Just walk away from this. Yeah. It's all over. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's so strange that he's even pursuing it, especially since yeah. Obama, the Obama administration didn't. Exactly right. Exactly right. So about the Isagoff Yahoo piece, uh, based on your experience, was that surprising to you or is that uh, no. run of the mills? It's not surprising. Yet. No, no that, that's what they do. There, there's a very, very clear, um, um, way to conceptualize and have approved a covert action program. Somebody comes up with an idea. Uh, there's there's a, a staff that handles this kind of thing. And what they do is they put it all in the right format, put it in the right memo, and then they send it to the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, OLC. That's where John Yu and Jay Bybee were um, during the, the battle days of torture in the Bush administration. Well, OLC, will stand on its head to, to come up with its own memo saying that the proposal is legal under US law. And then um, after negotiating language back and forth with their CIA counterparts, it goes to the National Security Council um, general counsel. And so the NSC's lawyers then work with the CIA's lawyers to come up with all the right legal language, and then it goes to the National Security Advisor for the final, well, the penultimate signature. If the National Security Advisor signs it, then it goes to the president in the form of a presidential finding, which is a different template, and then the president signs the finding. So this is where it broke down. And I'm surprised this, is, this has not been generally reported, but to me, this is the important part. 
it made its way through OLC. It made its way through all the lawyers, but it never made its way to the president because Donald Trump never had a chance to sign it, which tells me that H.R. McMaster said, are you people insane? We're not going to do this. And he killed it. That's why Julian's still alive today, because at least one person in the Trump White House hadn't lost his marbles yet and put an end to it. To me, that's the real story. So the last question for me, uh, at great risk to yourself and loss of uh, business opportunities and end of a career, I mean, you, you took a stand. Do you think you and other whistleblowers have taken stands? Do you think it has changed anything about the policies or if the CIA is just chugging along with the same old, old programs it's done for 60 years? That's a good question. Um, and you know, we have to, we have to judge, I think, based on incremental changes. Um, at first glance, I would say, you know, I hate to admit, but we really haven't affected much change. But that wouldn't really be true. Um, first of all, I was greatly, greatly heartened in December 2013 when Ed Snowden told the New York Times that Tom Drake and I inspired him to go public with his revelations. I'm traveling to New York, JFK on those flight 5776. Just a few more minutes, I'm going to start our boarding process. We're going to board soon. Sorry. Wear a mask as you walk through the boarding door, as well as throughout your travels with us. Once we begin, we'll start with passengers needing extra time or assistance, after which we'll invite our U.S. active duty military with ID, followed by our first class Diamond Elite 360. Members. Sorry. One sec. And on to our Comfort Plus, our Sky Priority, our main cabin, one, two, three, and finally, our, finally our basic economy. You're allowed one carry-on and one personal item, any more than two items. We ask that you please consolidate. Otherwise, we'll have to check the remainder beyond that number to your final destination. We're in need of about 15 to 20 passengers to check your bag to your final destination. Compliments of Delta, we will not be able to accommodate all of the bags in the overhead bin. So if you're willing to do so, please see me at this time with your bag along with your boarding pass. We'll check your bag. I, I, I would talk over him, but I'm afraid it would wreck your uh, recording. If we don't get enough volunteers, we'll have to mandatorily check toward the end of boarding. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, but Ed Snowden told the New York Times in December of 2013 that Tom Drake and I had inspired him to go public with his revelations. That in and of itself to me was worth it. But even better than that, once he made his revelations, and granted it's taken several years, public opinion has turned um, to the point where many Americans uh, object to being spied upon by government agencies. And little by little, members of Congress are coming around to voting the right way on some of these Patriot Act uh, provisions. So we're not there yet, and it's very, very slow, but we're getting there. And to me, that's all worth it. In, in my own case, in the case of the torture program, the, the benefits were, were far better. You know, I blew the whistle in 2007. The torture program was finally outlawed in, what was it? 2000, summer of 2015 uh, with the McCain-Feinstein amendment. And John McCain said on the floor of the Senate that had I not said anything, that the legislation would never have been possible. So it was worth it. Wow. Well, thank you so much, you know. Um, thank you. I, I, Good to meet you both. Yeah, I mean, I regret that you had to spend time behind bars. Ah, thank and, you. Um, it feels great that you've taken a terrible situation and turned it into a mechanism for uh, enlightening so many people. You know, people in the black community, of course, you can you can see that the people in the black community are disproportionately impacted by mass absolutely violence. right. So mm -hmm. many, if not most of us, have a deep understanding of it. But yes, America. It has to be changed. It has to be. It, the whole situation is untenable. Yes. You well, can't lock up everybody. This was fabulous, John. We deeply appreciate Thank it. Thank you. We're going to use the pleasure is mine. 
we're going to use it with our defend the science piece and we're going to also write an article about, about it here in the coming in the days in the la progressive Wonderful. so have a safe thank safe you travels, safe travels thanks so green. much i appreciate thanks it so i'll talk to you both right. soon all right okay. bye-bye bye-bye bye -bye. Oof.